All righty. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Coachpreneur Project COVID-19 exclusive broadcast or podcast or telecast, whatever you want to call this. Um, we, as a project, we're all about bringing evidence-based wellness strategies um, to our audiences that are mostly coaches, clinicians, consultants, um, and especially those who have gone through the amazing um, Mayo Clinic Wellness Coaching Program. And we are powered and inspired by lifestyle change and tennis of positive technology. And I'm aware that not uh, all of you are from the Mayo Clinic cohort uh, and all of that big thanks to uh, our sponsor, the Mayo Clinic, for letting us open the session up beyond the cohort. Uh, this is a one-time, uh, you know, opening up the session because uh, we wanted to curate something very specific around COVID-19, which is obviously on the entire planet's mind. Um, leave your email with us in the chat to receive the recorded link. And if you want to collaborate with us in the future, we're at the Coachpreneur Project at gmail.com. Um, Okay, uh, who are we? Uh, we're Mayo Clinic grads. We met at Mayo Clinic. Uh, the beautiful person you see on the right, the picture on the right is that of Deborah Woods, who's my project partner, and I'm Nivi Jaswal. And between the two of us, we have 40 years of cumulative corporate um, experience around healthcare, med devices, foods and beverage research and education. And we're both passionate about bringing creative community-based projects to life. Um, we also have with us um, Kylie Buckner, who I'm gonna talk about uh, in just a second before we go through the agenda. And uh, so welcome to the session. Uh, we will have about 40 minutes with Kylie. I will be interviewing with her about optimizing immunity uh, via lifestyle choices, especially now in the COVID-19 era. And uh, after that, Kylie will uh, take questions. Uh, we encourage you to ask questions in the chat box. We will collect those questions and then we can go ahead and ask uh, Kylie if there are some questions you desperately want answers from Kylie. Um, uh, then, you know, just let us know your email address. We will uh, strive to, uh, you know, get you those answers. Uh, and Deborah Woods, my dear project partner, will do the, um, you know, closing and, and she'll also ask you about some insights and takeaways from this session. So be ready. And uh, we only have two rules for everyone's uninterrupted listening and viewing pleasure. Please, please mute yourselves and ask questions in the chat box. Um, that said, uh, we welcome Kylie Buckner, a uh, dear friend, and uh, someone who I'm in awe of, you know, with everything that she, uh, you know, is achieving in life. She is um, a certified yoga teacher. She's MSN, RN from a credential standpoint. She's a lifestyle transition specialist. And she has over 18 years um, of experience working in women's health particularly in obstetrics and gynecology, labor and delivery, NICU, and pediatrics. And now she's currently working as the Director of Lifestyle Change for Mastering Diabetes. And for those of you who do not know about Mastering Diabetes, that's, first of all, bad form, because everyone in the world needs to know about Mastering Diabetes. <laughs> well, it's an online coaching platform to teach people with all forms of diabetes how to reverse insulin resistance. And insulin resistance is something that we are going to talk about a lot during this session. So please pay attention. And it is also the leading, uh, leading cause of blood glucose variability. Um, and, and Kylie is going to you know, educate us on what that exactly means. Uh, she works directly with clients living with type 1, type 1.5, type 2 diabetes, pre-diabetes, gestational diabetes uh, that sometimes occurs in pregnant women to help them achieve their best metabolic health utilizing the tools in the Mastering Diabetes Method. Using the evidence-based principles of lifestyle medicine, the tools in the method include adopting a low-fat, plant-based whole food diet, strategically adding intermittent fasting, exercise, and mindfulness techniques to improve health outcomes, reduce long-term health risks, and overall better the quality of life for people living with diabetes. She works side by side with her wonderful husband and Mastering Diabetes co-founder, Cyrus Kambada, PhD, who has been living with type one diabetes for almost 20 years now. Um, all right, that said, I am going to stop sharing and 
Welcome, Kylie. And uh, <laughs> I know that uh, you are, um, uh, you know, certified in Yin Yoga as well, and and that you just finished uh, teaching an online yoga class this morning uh, in beautiful Costa Rica, where you're dialing in from this morning, this afternoon, um, and uh, so I, I think you have something special in store for us before we start asking you all the questions. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here, and I thought that maybe in um, sort of to bring mindfulness to the center of our conversation. Um, we could start with a gentle uh, breath meditation to just help us to become centered and grounded and maybe release a little anxiety of the day. It's the end of a week for most people. And, um, you know, maybe you're carrying a little something and stress management is a huge tool for improving immunity overall. So um, I'd love to start with a breath, a gentle breath meditation. So wherever you are, if you could just um, find a comfortable seat placing your feet on the ground, just relax your hands into your lap and relax your shoulders, closing your eyes. Just begin to bring awareness into the space around you. And we're going to do a gentle three-part breath. So inhaling into the count of four Filling your lungs fully and wholly. One, two, three, four. And then exhaling to the count of six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And allow your breath to flow in and out of your nose, fully expanding your lungs on your inhale. Inhaling one, two, three, four, pausing at the top and holding your breath, filling your lungs, and then releasing over the count of six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Just taking two more rounds of this breath, becoming more and more present and aware of the sensation of your lungs filling with air, holding at the top of your four-part breath, and then releasing to the count of six. Taking one final round of breath, inhaling one, two, three, four. Exhaling one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, just gently lifting the crown of your head, sitting a little taller, relaxing your shoulders, gently opening your eyes and bringing yourself back into the space. This is I'm trying to tell which way you want to move. To. Giving yourself a moment to connect yes. <laughs> with your breath. And um, this breath is really special because by extending your exhale and releasing your breath over a longer period of time, you're actually allowing your autonomic nervous system to relax and it's a fabulous tool for stress relief it's super easy to do and it's a great strategy to use anytime you're starting to feel a little um, worried or anxious or out of your body so <laughs> all right that was wonderful thank you so much kylie such welcome. an amazing centering <laughs> and uh you know anchoring exercise for all of us all right let's start our <laughs> conversation <laughs> and um so, you know, yesterday when I woke up, I actually, uh, a notification popped up on my um, phone um, by ACLM, American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Mm -hmm. And it said something like um, that obesity is the top risk factor in uh, hospitalizations related to COVID-19 in New York City. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, I was, um, I, I kept thinking to myself, you know, it, it's like the demographics of how the expression of um, you know infections uh, that are related to this virus are happening seem to be changing quite a lot. Earlier, we thought that the demographic was you know people who were elderly and and they had to have some chronic illness, uh, especially with data coming out of Italy and Spain. Uh, but in the U.S., it seems like a slightly different situation. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, 
so first of all, why do you think is obesity a top risk factor? And the, the second related question is, what is the definition of obesity? Who is obese? Mm -hmm. Please help it define for us. Sure. So um, I saw that same study and I was obviously very surprised to see that too, although I wasn't that surprised because a lot of the research has been showing us that um, the connection between obesity and specifically insulin resistance being key connectors for um, risks of, of developing complications from COVID infections. Um, and to sort of give a little bit more of a background on what insulin resistance is, you know, obesity is actually one of the um, factors that can lead to a diagnosis of insulin resistance. Um, and insulin resistance is, the, is sort of the root cause, um, and obesity is one of the um, biomarkers, or weight is one of the biomarkers for insulin resistance. So, you know, in terms of obesity, when somebody's obese and carrying excess fat in their cells, um, you are living in a more inflamed state. The body develops a higher degree of inflammation as a result of excess stored fat. And so it's um, when, it, when we look at, um, you know, insulin resistance as, a, um, as it's like how we describe it and how we define it, um, obesity and is a part of it because the, stored, the storage of fat, insulin resistance is designed, defined as storage of fat in cells that are not designed to store excess fat. And so um, when somebody's obese, they're storing excess fat in all of the cells in their body, in all of the tissues in their body. And the reason, when somebody is obese and living with excess inflammation, we know that already is predisposing them to a weakened immune system. And when your immune system is weakened and in a weakened state, um, it puts you at higher degree of risk for the side effects and the, um, the, the uh, of COVID or any infection really. Right, so, so effectively what you're saying is that people who have insulin resistance that it, it primarily occurs because fat has somehow found its way into cells and tissues of the body where it's not supposed to be. And if you know, that amount of excess fat exists in you know, an organism's body, then we can say that that individual is obese and, and therefore they're insulin resistant and it, it paves the way or the foundation for them to have a weakened immune system and also develop certain other chronic conditions, which we're now seeing are um, also the additional risk factors for COVID-19. Okay, let's actually, let's take a step back and, uh -huh. and let's um, understand what is, um, you know, COVID-19? We hear just so, it, it's a time when our vocabulary is rapidly expanding. I've heard words like zoonotic, illnesses. Mm -hmm. I've heard words like SARS-CoV-2. And mm -hmm. then everyone obviously talks about COVID-19 and coronavirus to help demystify mm -hmm. these words for us. Okay. So a zoonotic illness is one, it's a virus that starts in an animal. And as uh, it mutates and changes, it becomes, uh, humans become susceptible to it. And so basically this virus started in an animal and has mutated to the point where it became susceptible for a human to um, contract it and to develop symptoms and then to begin spreading it. Um, the virus itself is called, it's a coronavirus and there are many, many forms of coronaviruses out there. And you're right, we are learning so much more about you know, immunology and viral, you know, how viruses work through this experience. And fortunately, there's a lot of great information out there. Um, the COVID-19 is the actual sort of disease that comes out of the coronavirus. So you could um, have the coronavirus in your body and not express many symptoms of it. And um, when you develop the severe symptoms of respiratory distress, that's the disease of COVID-19. And so they're two little bit different, um, you know, there's a difference. So one is the actual virus itself which can be measured and can be tested for. And then COVID-19 is, is the actual disease that's being treated. Um, right. Yeah. 
Yeah, go for it. You had something so, else. So, yeah. So, I mean, this particular virus is troublesome because it's spreading very quickly. It's become a pandemic very quickly. And, um, you know, it's putting a big strain on, obviously, healthcare systems all around the world. And, um, and it is causing a lot more complications for people than I think what, um, you know, what other viruses have caused in the past. Now, is there any specific reason why it is so virulent and uh, so aggressive and difficult to pin down? Well, part of that is the mutation and the way that it's mutating. Um, that is being studied and there, you know, hopefully researchers are going to find um, how to like pin this virus down. But viruses are always are mutating often. So virus, viral mutation is a common experience for, you know, for within the viral world. Like viruses are organisms. They grow, they live, they have a purpose. Um, and this particular virus, you know, um, just happens to be a very sticky virus. It lives for a long time and it's very contagious, but so much so they weren't really sure how it was spreading at first. You know, they weren't sure if it was, it was, they were having a hard time really defining if it was droplet, airborne, you know, um, contact. And so that makes it really hard to predict as well what it's going to do next um, in terms of the mutation. And so, you know, obviously that's why um, we're all being asked to participate in things like social distancing and you know, strict hand washing so that we can help reduce and mitigate our spread of this virus as much as possible. Right. Okay. So we have a slightly better understanding of, you know, what this is and all these different terms, what they mean. So um, SARS-CoV-2 is the name of the virus. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an RNA virus. It's also called the coronavirus or the novel coronavirus mm -hmm. from family of coronaviruses that exist um, mm -hmm. already. And mm -hmm. the infection you mentioned that it causes or the disease mm -hmm. that it causes is called COVID-19. Did I get that right? Yes. All right. Okay. Yeah. So, so let's zoom into immunity, inflammation, cytokine storms, you know, so well, mm -hmm. uh, I've met here in Boston, we're so used to nor'easters and those kind of storms, <laughs> but cytokine storms are, uh, you know, uh, another uh, new addition to our vocabulary. And, and you mentioned um, earlier that obesity leads to insulin resistance and then that leads to inflammation. Mm -hmm. So how does um, the coronavirus virus tap into this insulin resistant related inflammation and lead to whatever this cytokine storm is, you know, if you can help us understand. Yeah, sure. So, okay, this is a, you know, it's an interesting topic because all of a sudden, like you said, all of a sudden cytokine storm has become the new storm that we're talking about. And we don't you know it's in terms of um, healthcare, cytokine storms have only been sort of studied and researched since the early 90s. So it's a newer concept for, from the, in, the immunologists that are out there researching um, what's happening inside people's bodies. So um, there are other types of viruses that will cause a cytokine storm. So this isn't the first one, and they actually did track it with some of the other outbreaks of things like um, the SARS virus um, and uh, I, and I think also H1N1, they were, um, they were tracking these, this effect of these viruses. And so um, a cytokine, okay, so cytokines, just to sort of break it down a little bit, we have an immune system, right? So it's, we have multiple systems in our bodies. And you know, this is one of the things that what we do in our program is we teach people a lot about how your body actually works. You know, we're all given these bodies that we're not given an instruction manual for, and we don't really know what's happening at the cellular level of our bodies. And the immune system is just highly, highly fascinating when you start looking at the cellular level. When you look at um, what happens in the immune system, when you have an infection, like let's say you come in contact with a virus, any virus, naturally what happens is that will invade some tissue in your body. And cytokines are released as a, basically to signal your immune system to come to that area. So a cytokine is a signal. It, is a, it sends out the SOS, like, help, help, we need help over here. And it calls the white blood cells to the table. It calls the killer T cells to the table. It calls macrophages to the table. And so cytokines are present in your body, and they actually lead to the immune system response, which is a perfectly normal reaction when you come in contact with a virus or a bacteria that your body needs to fight off. And so an inflammatory process can be a very natural and healthy way of your body ridding itself of a, an intruder, like a virus. 
So what happens with a cytokine storm, and, and sort of this to tie this back to the obesity question, is that when people are obese, they often are spilling out um, fat cells. There's, their fat cells are, are hypoxic because the blood flow is poor to those cells. They often are even releasing the contents of the cells will release if they become too enlarged. So you know your fat cells are only designed to hold small amounts of fat. And when they start enlarging and growing, eventually they break open. And so cytokines end up being released at that level. And so that's how you develop a low-grade inflammation all around the body because the, the cytokines come out and they call them all these parts of the blood cell, of the white, um, sorry, of your immune system, your immune cells to come and respond to this localized inflammatory process. And so, um, as a, like, so when you have obesity and you have this underlying inflammation, all of a sudden you get a viral attack, you have a virus that appears in your body and the cytokine activity just goes wild. And basically it's an overreaction of cytokines telling the blood, the immune system, come, we need more, we need more, we need more help. And when you already are living with that sort of um, underlying cytokine activity, creating inflammation, it's weakening the immune system, and the cytokine, response, the cytokine storm is a response to that. And um, a cytokine storm is basically an impaired functioning. So you think of it, you could think of it as like an over-release of cytokines or an over-exaggeration of a natural process. And unfortunately, um, the acute lung injury is a common consequence of the cytokine storm. And so that's what we're, exactly what we're seeing with COVID patients that are already somehow immunocompromised, whether it's from obesity or other factors. And because their immune system is already kind of activated all the time at this low level activation, and the cytokine storm comes in and calls the immune system to action, and it basically causes this lung disease. Right. Um, so, so um, j just so I got this right, right? Okay. So we have a number on the scale. Mm -hmm. Is our weight number? Mm -hmm. and then it's composed of all the bones we have and the muscle tissue we have, and also the fat that we have and the water that we carry in our body. Mm -hmm. And then if we have excess adipose tissue, that is excess fat. Mm -hmm. then we might be overweight or we might enter the ranges of what is called obesity. And if those fat cells get larger than they're supposed to be, the spillover and, you know, they're hypoxic, which means they're not, you know, supplied with um, nutrient bearing oxygen and, you know, blood and all of those things. Um, they, they, the cytokines, which are the soldiers mm -hmm. and the signalers of the immune system, they rush to that spot. And, and in any case, there is a lot of cytokine activity in people who have excess obesity, um, the excess adipose tissue. And the mm -hmm. cytokine storm starts when they're you know, face to face with a virus like the coronavirus. And mm -hmm. it's a classic case of a good guy gone bad. Mm -hmm. right? So they marshal you know, their resources more and more. They call for more reinforcements. And in doing so, they not only want to you know, kill the virus, but also attack other um, organs and uh, leading to ac acute respiratory distress, uh, distress syndrome, which is ARDS that you know, we do see a lot being uh, yes. presented in, in patients with COVID-19 and ultimately multi-organ failure. Okay. Absolutely. All right. So, so we, we understood obesity. We understood um, insulin resistance. We understand these different words around COVID-19 coronavirus. What can we do about it? So we want to zoom into nutrition, you know, and, and when we think about nutrition and, uh, you know, all the happy conversation that we want to do here, you know, want to move away from the pathogenesis uh, conversation, we hear so much of it already. Um, I want to talk about microbiome mm -hmm. and I want you to draw the, you know, the distinction between inflammatory foods and non-inflammatory foods. Okay. Um, so the human, the microbiome, the gut microbiome is another fascinating um, system in our body, our, our GI system. You know, we typically think of our GI system as being the area where we digest food, we eat, we digest food, we receive nutrients into our bloodstream, and, um, and then we excrete it as waste. So, um, but actually, as it turns out, there's so much research going on in the gut microbiome about the immune factors of the, the microbiome. And the microbiome is basically 
the system of bacteria that live within your gut and that are responsible for breaking down your food, that are responsible for um, di all, all parts of digestion. And as it turns out, they're also highly, highly responsible for um, a large amount of immune system development and functioning. And um, actually up to 70%, as I've recently learned. So, which is a large part, because that's not where we typically tend to think of where our immune system lives. But, as it, but our gut is, um, has a large surface area in our body. Our intestines are full of surface area, and they're connected to blood vessels that are interwoven into our body. And so there's a high degree of cellular um, activity with the immune system, in in, even in forming some of the cells of the immune system. So um, many, there are many people that are living with some form of gut dysbiosis. And um, this also, and that basically means it's a disruption of your microbiome in some way. And sometimes these uh, disruptions can be diagnosed as things like IBS or SIBO or things like that. So those are common um, gut microbiome disruptions. Um, and really, uh, the interesting thing is that when, you're, when you have a disruption of your gut microbiome, you're more likely to have, again, like it, it impacts your immune system and can impact your immune functioning. And so one of the best things that you can do for building your gut microbiome is eating fiber-rich foods. Um, diets that are high in fiber are, first of all, they are anti-inflammatory foods. Um, they're also feeding the microbiome. So if you want to like get down to the like sort of the lowest layer of how do I take care of my gut bi microbiome um, the best way possible, it's through fiber and fiber from whole foods. And so you know um, there's there's a great deal of research. And in fact, if you want to learn more about this, I definitely recommend Dr. Will Bolsowitz's book. It's coming out in May. He wrote a book called Fiber Fueled. We love learning from him. He's a fabulous physician and he's a gastroenterologist. And he basically wrote this book at such an interesting time because he basically explains all of these processes in his book as to why gut dysbiosis is the connection to immune functioning, to blood glucose regulation, to, you know, he makes connections between diabetes and gut dysbiosis, which are really strong. So, you know, we are, um, we, in our program, and, and what we do is we teach people how to add high fiber foods into their diet because they're the most anti-inflammatory, um, plant-based foods are anti-inflammatory by nature. Um, they also contain anti-inflammatory properties which help to support your immune system. And um, you know, we could talk about more of those types of foods later, but um, the, the adding more fiber rich foods to your diet is one way to really care for yourself internally and support the functioning of your microbiome. Right. Okay. So you mentioned fiber mm -hmm. and, and you said that fiber, fiber is one of those key things that we you know, need in our body um, to keep a very healthy gut health or gut microbiome um, to, to be healthy. Um, and you mentioned that plant foods are sources of non-inflammatory nutrition and specifically um, for fiber. So would it be fair to say that animal foods do not contain any fiber? Yes. Yeah. I mean, so the foods that are fiber poor would be animal foods, um, meats, cheese, dairy products. Um, not only that, but dairy products are shown to be the most highly inflammatory foods that you could put into your body. So, you know, between um, re not having fiber containing, you know, um, these inflammatory um, properties. Um, so, yeah, the categories of foods would be the meats, fish, cheese, dairy, um, eggs. All of those foods are pro-inflammatory foods. And they impact all of the cells in your body. And actually, they're also, they also tend to be the foods that are highest in fat. And when it comes, we, like if we want to go back to insulin resistance and obesity, those foods are the foods that contribute to the development of insulin resistance. And they contribute to the development of obesity in the long run. When you eat a diet that's high in fat, um, you can store that excess fat inside your cells. And unfortunately, what happens then is that you, when you go to eat foods that are higher in carbohydrate, 
there's no room for the glucose to go because the fat has already taken up space inside the cell. So fat is very, very easily absorbed into, this, into the cells and in the tissues of your body. And that's what makes them so inflammatory. Because when you digest a meal that has a higher content of fat in it, the fat slips out of the GI system very quickly and into the bloodstream. And fat droplets do not require um, any escort to get into the cells of your tissue. So if you're looking at your muscle cell, all, all of the cells inside your muscles, your liver, all of your organs, um, they don't require an escort to bring the fat into the cell. So when you consume a diet high in fat, um, those fat cells or the, the fat from the food is going to make its way into your cells before the glucose, which is the energy that your cells actually need to function. Hmm, interesting. So bad news for uh, yeah, you know, anyone here who loves eggs and bacon and cheese and, you know, dairy and, and so on. But, um, okay, so, you know, how, how they say moderation, everything in moderation. And, uh, you know, some people believe in the golden mean. Mm -hmm. And, and there is a belief that if I eat plants, but I also eat animal products, especially the good ones, you know, like milk and cheese, they're supposed to give me my calcium and protein and some eggs. They're supposed to be good for us. We're all always told that. Is, mm -hmm. is that okay? From, from a gut microbiome immunity optimization standpoint, what is the mastering diabetes? <laughs> Our perspective is that no amount of animal proteins, products, foods are good amounts. Um, you know, and that doesn't mean necessarily you have to just drop everything and take them out right away. Like we have a process that helps you adopt a whole food plant-based diet, but ultimately in the long term, when you look at long-term studies of, um, you know, chronic conditions and um, mortality rates, diets that are high in fat, diets that contain high, high amounts of animal products tend to cause the highest degree of health complications. And it all starts with insulin resistance. You know, insulin resistance is connected to diabetes, heart disease, cancer. Um, it's sort of the root of all of these other conditions that are diagnosed or symptoms of insulin resistance. And so we um, have shown with, um, again, through, there's a body of evidence out there that shows exactly how these foods are beneficial for you for your long-term health for your immune health and for your gut health. So um, we don't promote any um, animal foods or dairy, oil. These are inflammatory foods that will contribute to insulin resistance. That, that's, this is something very interesting that you're mentioning. Uh, you know, earlier I was looking at some numbers and, and I have some estimates you know, on prediabetes, et cetera. Mm -hmm. China, 35.7% of their population has prediabetes. The US, 36.5%. If you look mm -hmm. at people who are obese or overweight um, in terms of adult populations, 47% of Americans are obese or overweight. You know, and we know that about, uh, you know, from lots of different, uh, you know, data that uh, has been shared by ACLM as well. India, uh, you know, in South Asia, very high percentage of the adult population, mm -hmm. close to 42% obese. So, so this message mm -hmm. of eating a low fat, whole foods, plant-based uh, diet or, or lifestyle um, seems to be relevant, not just for one country or, you know, or two countries, but it seems to be very relevant for the rest, for the entire world. And especially uh, when we're faced with an assault on our immunity uh, given COVID-19. So let's do a little deep dive on this low fat, plant-based whole foods, um, you know, dietary pattern and, and understand if there are some specific superfoods uh, you might want to suggest to us when we look at our immunity? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, so we, um, when you look at your overall sort of um, health and long-term health outcomes, when you're eating a diet that has a variety of whole foods from you know, fruits and vegetables and legumes and whole grains, you're going to give yourself a wide variety of nutrients. Um, whole foods contain the most nutrient-dense uh, they are the most nutrient dense foods that are out there. So um, some of the, you know, eating basically the way that we like to describe it is that you eat a variety of these foods so that you're getting a variety of nutrients. You know, there's not one food that has all the nutrients that you need, but when you eat a variety of the whole foods throughout the day, you're going to hit these targets. And you're going to get wonderful things. Um, whole foods contain uh, water, fiber, minerals, vitamins, antioxidants and phytochemicals. 
And when it comes to um, immune support, um, what they're, what, you know, what researchers, what nutrition researchers have known for a long time is that phytochemicals are incredibly important and play a huge role in cellular health and specifically in the immune, in the immune system cellular health. So um, phytonutrients are things that um, basically help promote, um, like they protect cells and they, they do this within their own plants. But then when you consume them, it actually, they provide the same benefit within your cells. So they're very protective. Right. So, so um, then the assumption would be that fruits are okay and that, you know, we, we've been taught sugar is bad uh, for diabetics. What about plant sugar, all the sugar mm -hmm. in the plants? Okay. So we make one really important key distinction in our method, and that is that fruit does not contain sugar. Sugar is a substance that is highly refined and is made from, usually from a plant source, but it's refined so much so that there's zero nutritional value left in that substance. And it's used as an additive and it is highly addictive and it is a substance. Fruit is a whole food that contains all of the nutrients that your body needs in its whole form and they're best absorbed when eaten in their whole form. So when you eat a piece of fruit, you will get glucose from that, but that is not the same thing as sugar. Glucose is a breakdown of carbohydrate, which is a fuel for every cell of your body. And we know physiologically that our bodies run on glucose. And you know, when you're eating that carbohydrate along with the fiber, the minerals, the vitamins, the water, the phytochemicals, and the antioxidants, it's you know, nature's most perfect food. And so you know, this conception that um, fruit equals sugar is something that we demystify every day. And we have people, every person in our program has diabetes. Our company is called Mastering Diabetes. And every single person, I mean, I can't tell you how fun it is to take somebody who's been living with type 1 diabetes, who's been avoiding fruit for so many years, and all of a sudden they start eating a fruit-rich diet and their blood glucose start to actually come into range for the first time. They start dropping their insulin needs. Their blood glucose stabilizes. They get amazing, amazing, amazing results. And this happens really quickly. When you move from a diet that is high in fat to a diet that is low in fat and high in carbohydrate, your body can then take the carbohydrate on and take the glucose on much more easily. And so we um, you know, love teaching people how to eat fruit. It's the best part of our day. And um, fruit is, you know, when we talk about specific nutrients, you know, the, all the nutrients I listed before, um, some of the things in terms of your um, immune health that are really amazing are the antioxidants found in fruits. And other, and other foods too, vegetables. Antioxidants are so supportive in, re, in re, reducing inflammation in your body. So, you know, if somebody does have um, a sort of a low level inflammation that's happening in their body from maybe years of obesity or other issues that they've had, other health conditions, um, you know, antioxidants are wonderful things to add in. And you can find um, wonderful antioxidants in things like green tea, berries, um, cruciferous vegetables, they are amazing for adding, for improving your gut health and for, you know, improving your immune system. Um, the other, um, some of the other sort of micronutrients like phytochemicals that you can find are in things like um, garlic and onions. And these contain things called flavonoids and the whole family of micronutrients that help your cells do the work they're supposed to do. And in addition, they also help reduce inflammation and they um, help support your first line of defense and your immune system cells. So, you know, these foods are, are well established um, and, and eating, a, like I said, eating a variety of whole foods in combination with each other will help you to experience all of the benefit of these nutrients. Right. So when you mention these different foods, you know, cruciferous vegetables or the aromatics like um, onions and um, garlic and the release allicin, which is a known mm -hmm. flavonoid, et cetera. These are all really good. Mm -hmm. um, when, so do you advocate eating them raw? Do you advocate cooking them or, you know, drizzling olive oil on our salads, uh, you know, extra, extra virgin olive oil, um, mm -hmm. also adding supplements to our diets? You know, I'm just trying yeah. to understand when you say low fat, whole foods, plant-based diets, mm -hmm. what should the plate really look like? Mm -hmm. That's a really great question. You know, um, it should look something that feels really appealing for you. You know, first of all, like look for foods that you would enjoy eating. Um, in combination, um, you know, adding, um, 
you know, lots of greens to every meal is a really great way to add more fiber into your diet. Um, eating a variety of foods like whole grains and beans and vegetables along with raw greens is a really great way to maximize the nutrients that are in those foods. Um, adding things like onion and, and garlic to the food that you're cooking or eating raw is also wonderful. Um, and you can, you can really choose how this works in your lifestyle. That's the beauty. If you like to prepare foods that are more and eat foods in a raw form, um, you know, fruits and vegetables primarily that works. Um, but if you're, if you enjoy cooking foods and putting foods together and preparing foods, um, you know, you can still put foods together and cook them and still get the nutri nutritional benefit from them, which is really great. Um, we, we don't recommend using olive oil. It is a highly inflammatory substance, another highly refined, you know, they have, they take, they take the olive, right? Which is a food that does contain nutrients and they basically smush all of the nutrients out of it and make this highly refined product that is a substance that is highly addictive and is highly inflammatory. I mean, um, if you'd like more information on oil and heart health and cardiovascular health, um, you know, Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn has done tremendous work on cardiovascular health and specifically the risks of using olive oil and oil of any kind. So, you know, we um, cite his work and use his ref use him as a reference all the time. So, okay. So no olive oil, no animal products, no oil of any type. Um, wouldn't I become deficient in certain nutrients? Mm -hmm. So supplementation, how mm -hmm. do I go about that? So when you're um, looking to adopt a whole food diet, a uh, plant-based whole food diet, um, one, there is one, there's two nutrients in particular that can be more challenging to get that you really can't get from the diet is um, vitamin D and B12. Those two nutrients are vitamins that are very important for immune functioning, for nervous system functioning, for, all, they, for absorbing other minerals and vitamins into your body. So they're important to first monitor and second to supplement. And so, but uh, you know, most people are, uh, when they've done studies on B12 deficiencies, they're, they're pretty common no matter what dietary practices you have. So um, we do recommend those supplements, but otherwise, if you're eating a variety of whole foods, um, one of the best things that you can do, and I love this tool, is to start logging your food. There's food logging apps, um, and the best way to know is to see and to actually put it to the test. And so when you start logging your food, the app we really love is called Chronometer, um, and they have an app where you can literally put every bite of food into this app. And, or until they have a website too. Um, and when you're logging your food, you actually get to see the breakdown of all of your macronutrients, all of your micronutrients, your fiber intake, all of the, um, you know, you can just see it all splayed out for you, which is great because then there's no guesswork. You know, then you're just, it, you're eating, you're getting your nutrients and you're seeing what's in there. And, you know, we teach this tool to all of our clients because it's a really important strategy in understanding your you know, your, what's happening inside your body. You know, the only way to really know is to document it and to see what you're eating and how your meals are in um, nutrient value. And I'll tell you, it never ceases to amaze me. I can put together any combination of food and I am, you know, I, I easily meet my protein needs every day, I easily meet my micronutrient needs every day. You know, I take my B12 supplement and I'm good to go. And it's a very, 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 um, fun process to start playing around with that to see, oh, if I add this food in, what happens to my daily values? And if I take away this food, what happens? And, you know, and even try it out with things like if you, you know, if you're curious about like adding things in like eggs or cheese or dairy, I mean, you'll start to see how those things actually um, change your amount of saturated fat every day or change your amount of nutrients. So like the more foods that you eat that are, that are not um, whole foods, the less nutrient value you're going to have in your diet. And you'll see that very clearly when you log your food. Right. So as they say, you know, you can only hack what you track. And, and that's an excellent mm -hmm. example of what you just mentioned. Um, these apps like Chronometer, there's another one called MyFitnessPal, which I know is not as exhaustive mm -hmm. in terms mm -hmm. of listing, um, you know, the, the trace minerals and the micronutrients, et cetera. Chronometer is awesome. And so what is the goal here from a macronutrient standpoint? Do you have mm -hmm. a recommendation on uh, the percentage carbs to fats to proteins um, mm -hmm. that you want um, your clients to look at? Mm -hmm. So um, we recommend carbohydrate range of 70 to 80% uh, 
per day. Wow. Yeah, which is a big change for a lot of people. And, you know, that's a big shift in their nutrients and then how they're getting their food every day. So that's a big, big shift. Um, and then 15% protein and 10 to 15% protein, 10 to 15% of your calories from fat. So what that means is if you were to log your food, and look at a whole day's worth of calories that you consume. When you look at chronometer, they actually give you a nice little grid and there's like a, a pie chart which shows you what percentage of your calories came from fat, protein, and carbohydrate. When you keep your total fat intake in that 10 to 15% range, your level of insulin resistance decreases dramatically. And um, so for people in our program who measure their blood glucose, they can see a change in their blood glucose right away. Yes. which is really impressive. You know, it's really cool to see that connection. Like you were saying before, you can, you know, uh, what you if you can hack it, you can track it. If you track it, you can hack it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, you kind of can watch that exactly yeah. happening. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what it looks like from a practical standpoint is if I were to dry saute or water fry, mm -hmm. water stir fry my vegetables, mm -hmm. I am more likely to achieve the 75, 80, 10, 15 percent macroeconomic ratio, mm -hmm. uh, macro um, nutrient ratio, uh, ratio that you mentioned. But mm -hmm. if I were to add even a teaspoon of olive oil or sesame oil or coconut oil or any of those amazing avocado oil mm -hmm. to any of my salads or my soups or my stir fries, then that needle is going to shift dramatically in favor of fat. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and a very acidic form of fat. Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, Kylie, we have heard about vitamin C. We have heard about um, so many other, you know, things people are stockpiling in addition to toilet paper, of course, you know, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, so uh, supplements, uh, is there something that you recommend or, uh, you know, is there a particular micronutrient that uh, you, you think that people should have more of in their, in, in their diet um, and, and how do we source it? Sure. So, you know, there's been studies over the years about zinc being a really powerful um, support for your immune system. And with this um, virus, they're studying zinc in the, the trials that they're doing and how it's working. And what they, you know, what we know is that zinc is part of the, it helps your immune system with stopping the replication of viral activity. And it seems to be doing that in this virus as well. Um, I guess preliminary research is showing that. So, you know, zinc is a, is, uh, is a nutrient that's easy to obtain in plant-based foods. You can find them in beans, in particular chickpeas. Beans and legumes are one family of foods that just are some of the most nutrient-rich foods you can possibly eat in general. And they happen to be high in zinc. Um, nuts and seeds are also very high in zinc. So, you know, adding some of those foods into your day would be, um, you know, helpful and supportive of your immune system. The other nutrient is vitamin D. And vitamin D is, they're showing, is, is really supportive of your, of, again, of immune functioning and, and of your immune cells. And so um, that's another really important nutrient to be including in your diet. And um, it's, it's possibly something you would want to be supplementing if you're not getting sun. If you can get directly from the sun, if you're in an area where you can get vitamin D directly from the sun, that's your best absorption. Your skin is your best converter of vitamin D. Um, and again, anytime you can take something and get it from the right from the source, it's going to be much better absorbed and taken in by the body. All right. Okay. So basically what a low fat, um, whole foods, plant-based diet ensures is that we intake whole foods and then the body knows what mm -hmm. dosage of whatever's inside that whole food to absorb. And, and it, it basically is the most bioavailable way of eating your food and maximizing nutrition without needing to lean on marketing myths exactly. um, like olive oil or excessive supplementation in the absence of a clinically proven nutrition defi de nutrient de deficit. So if somebody has a, uh, a deficit of vitamin D or B12 or C or anything like that, then under medical supervision, it's okay for them to have the supplement for, but for the rest of us, um, just trying to be um, you know, at, at an optimized immunity level, we, we should just have whole foods. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Um, 
the, the last question, because there are tons and tons of wonderful, wonderful questions mm -hmm. that we have, and we do want to take a stab at um, mm -hmm. all of them. <laughs> For sure. And, yeah, so I want you to help us with um, resources, you know, mm -hmm. uh, books. And, and I know that, you know, you guys just re released an amazing book that uh, became New York Times bestseller, uh, which is awesome. So heartiest congratulations for that. Um, and, uh, you know, are there any summits that people can attend? Are there meal planners, documentary films, uh, mm -hmm. while we're all under a lockdown, uh, if, mm -hmm. if there are things we can do? Absolutely. Um, oh my gosh, there's so many wonderful resources out there right now to learn more. And the first thing is I definitely, the Mastering Diabetes book just came out in February. It was an instant New York Times bestseller. We're so, 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 so proud of that. And just so excited for, um, you know, the work that's being done in our, you know, in our program. And um, the really great thing is that it's bringing attention and awareness to insulin resistance. And that is the key of our, it's a key focus of our business and what we do helping people reverse insulin resistance achieve their health goals you know that's sort of our, our the name of our game so check out our mastering diabetes website um, you'll find resources to get to the book um, it's masteringdiabetes.org we also last weekend hosted a special sort of rapid response covid summit uh, where we interviewed experts in nutrition diabetes health um, and uh, we had a pulmonologist, we had um, endocrinologists on board, you know, we had nine specialists who were able to shed a lot of light on what's happening with COVID. And, you know, I've learned so much from them and it's such an important topic. And, you know, they all will, and Dr. Bolsowitz is in it with the gut health MD. So, you know, it, we, are, uh, we are actually running a replay weekend this weekend. And so if, if anybody wants to hear more about any of the topics that I talked about today, they go into much greater depth and detail and they, the interviews are phenomenal. So I highly recommend that. You can register on our website, masteringdiabetes.org backslash thrive. Um, and then in terms of like the how to's of adopting a whole food plant-based diet, you know, one documentary that comes to mind and, and organization that comes to mind is Forks Over Knives. They have a documentary on Netflix. It's a, at one point was the highest viewed net, uh, documentary on all of Netflix. Um, it's a wonderful, um, it walks through, it teaches you about the benefits of a plant-based diet and why for long-term health, this is a phenomenal approach. Um, they also have multiple cookbooks. They have a meal planner. They have recipes on their website. If you're looking to get inspired to start making meals that contain whole foods, Forks Over Knives is a great resource. Um, in terms of understanding more about heart health and, you know, the oil connection, um, the uh, Engine 2 program, which is Rip Esselstyn, who is the son of Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, um, that whole family of um, experts, they are whole food, plant-based, low-fat, no oil promoting um, family, and they do wonderful work as well. So they're a great source of inspiration for us, and we uh, definitely encourage people to check them out. Right. Those are some excellent resources, um, Kylie. And, and I just wanted to let our audience know that every single word that you have mentioned in terms of resources, these documentary films and books, et cetera, we will ensure that um, we'll send out an email or a message uh, to everyone. And so please feel free to leave your email um, address with us. Um, it's 1.54 p.m. Eastern. Um, I'm going to start looking at the questions that we've received, um, you know, so that, and, and people have very kindly, I, I think that whoever mm -hmm. can, uh, they will try to stay on for another um, eight to 10 minutes. And we have Mew. Mew oh. is here. Mew is here. Mew she is loves here. to be on camera. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, it's a, you know, Mew is a celebrity cat at Mastering <laughs> Diabetes. Um, but Mew, CEO. Yeah, and, and Mew is not plant-based. <laughs> no, she is yeah. not. <laughs> no, she's not. She eats as uh, per her species. She right? follows the ketogenic diet, we call it. Yes, exactly. As opposed to the <laughs> ketogenic diet, which yeah. uh, once again is a huge myth as well. So anyway, um, let me start with questions. Um, the first question, and, and I might actually just go through uh, some of these and say, you know, and, and ask the person if they've been answered already so they can tell us yes, and, and then we can quickly move on to the other one. So Jessica asks, why exactly does insulin resistance cause weakened immunity? I think we've discussed the pathogenesis, you know, mm -hmm. fairly in detail, and, and we know why that 
happened to Jessica, just in case you have a, a more specific question, which has not been answered, just feel free to ask, you know, just raise your hand or something and we'll get to it. Mitch uh, from PPMNY uh, wants to know, so does that mean obesity is not necessarily related to weight? I think I mentioned that in, in one of the paraphrasing that I was, uh, you know, doing um, uh, in, in response to your answer, Kylie, uh, all the things... Yeah. Could I actually, you know, like yeah, in regards it. to the obesity thing, you know, yeah. one thing about um, when we look at overall health, you know, health is a state of mind. You know, we look at uh, insulin resistance in terms of biomarkers and weight is one of them. When you are not at your ideal weight, you're considered, you know, it's one of the biomarkers we use to sort of define insulin resistance. And so, you know, when it comes to obesity and people who are obese, they are already living with a level of insulin resistance just from having um, you know, excess fat in their body. Um, the other biomarkers of insulin resistance are A1C, fasting blood glucose, blood pressure, and uh, lipids. So cholesterol, all of your lipid panels. So there's cholesterol, triglycerides, LDL, cholesterol. So when any of those metrics and biometrics are elevated or raised, that puts you in a more insulin resistant state. What we know about insulin resistance is that insulin resistance and inflammation are highly, highly correlated. So, if you're, so that's where the connection is between the obesity and insulin resistance and your impaired immunity because of the, the, cytokine, the, the baseline cytokine activity that's happening, causing this low-grade inflammation throughout your body. And, um, you know, I, I feel like I didn't really make that connection at the beginning and um, I wanted to and it wasn't. I'm having a hard time finding my words, to be honest. So, <laughs> um, so, but you know, the insulin resistance again is sort of that that root that's holding all of these other conditions. And when you treat the insulin resistance, and we do it so well with a low-fat plant-based whole food diet, when you treat the insulin resistance, the lipids they drop. You know, you see cholesterol levels coming down. You see A1C levels coming down. You see blood glucose is coming down, fasting glucose. Is, we see weight dropping. I mean, I just uh, was on a coaching call with somebody this week, and she has lost 140 pounds in the last, you know, two years, but following a whole food plant-based diet. And it's very, 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 very easy to see the connections when you're looking at actual biomarkers and looking at the actual data and the numbers. Right. And, and the numbers speak for themselves, um, mm -hmm. you know, with your method. Um, so Jessica has another question. Can you clarify the exact relationship between obesity and fat cells breaking and then releasing these cytokines and the relationship between insulin resistance? And, uh, and, and she mentions in parentheses, fat not in adipocytes. So, so essentially fat that is not stored in your fat cells, but it's stored oh. in other, you know, non-fat cells other and muscle tissues. tissue and liver and pancreas where it's not, not supposed to be. Um, so, sorry. Okay. Could you just re rephrase the question for me? Right. So the exact relationship between obesity and fat cells breaking and releasing cytokines and uh, the relationship between insulin resistance and cytokine storm. So essentially what she's talking mm -hmm. about is, you know, okay. how does the domino effect? Got it. Okay. Occur? Sure. So, okay. So somebody, let's say somebody's following a diet that's very high in fat, you know, it's standard American diet, very high in fat. They start gaining weight slowly over the course of time. They start storing fat both inside the cells and which is the insulin resistance. And they start storing excess fat in their adipose tissue. Adipose tissue is designed to store fat. That is a cell, that is a cell and a tissue that has protective mechanisms. It's designed to actually store and hold fat but there is a limit of how much it can hold. So you have dueling processes happening. You've got the adipose tissue, which is growing, your cells are growing, and they're expanding, and then you've got the insulin resistance happening on the inside of the cell. So you're eating this high fat diet, you've got the cells that are now becoming enlarged with, um, with fat instead of glucose, you know, with, and, and cells are designed to hold a very small little fat droplet. Like that is okay. Like we're not saying this, you know, we don't promote a no fat approach. So, you know, we are des we're designed to store small amounts of fat for energy and for staying warm. And, and you know, there's reasons for having, um, for having fat cells and fat in our bodies. So as you're developing this adipose, you know, the adipose tissue as it's growing and you're gaining weight, you're also developing this background insulin resistance, which you cannot see because it's inside the cells. The way you see it is through 
your biomarkers, your A1C starts to go up, your fasting blood glucose starts to go up, your blood pressure goes up, your um, you know, blood lipids start to increase. And that's where the insulin resistance is. So now you've got an insulin resistant person who's also carrying a lot of excess weight that you can see, because it's more visible, and now you have a very highly inflamed person because they're layering fat inside, both inside their cells and outside of, and inside their adipose tissue, which is outside of the cells of the muscles, right? So when you start reducing that level of insulin resistance, you start changing your diet, you make you know, different lifestyle choices, maybe start moving your body, burn off this excess fat, it's coming out of the cells, it's coming out of the um, adipose tissue, and that's where the inflammation can start to reside. And you know, again, this impacts your immune system because you're gonna reduce the cytokine activity. So now you take somebody who was maybe highly inflamed, potentially at risk for a cytokine storm and long-term effects of that, including acute respiratory disease, you know, acute lung dis um, diseases. And now you've reversed the insulin resistance, you've reversed the, the weight, you've lost the weight, and now you're living with a much healthier immune support. So when you do come in contact with a virus, your immune system isn't already activated. It can go and do its job the way it's supposed to. Right, it's not already revved up, and then mm -hmm. it's not going to make all those mistakes and mistakenly attack all the other organs, and especially the lung tissue, which mm -hmm. is so critical. Exactly. Um, okay, so so that was a great answer. And uh, there's another one. Can you speak about sugar? Fruits contain natural sugar. Is that bad? I think we've answered that question. Also, vitamin supplements are they important? We've answered that. I like the distinction between sugar and fruit sourced glucose. They are not the same. We agree with you, Gail Mayer. Uh, what is the best and worst time to eat disha that's her question to eat best and worst time to eat um best and worst time to eat fruit i see okay yes um okay so one of the things that we teach people in our program is to kind of um look at your day and what's happening in your day so everyone's day is a little different some people you know you wake up in the morning maybe some people wake up very early in the morning and they're very active first thing in the morning um, we talk about food in terms of carbohydrate and the grams of carbohydrate. And if you, when you look at your day, we recommend eating fruit because it's very carbohydrate rich at the beginning parts of your day because it's gonna help fuel you through the rest of your morning and through your afternoon. So um, truthfully, we eat fruit pretty much all time of day. We eat, um, a lot of times we put fruit in our salads, we put papaya, mango, pineapple in our salads for dinner at night. But um, you don't, you know, if you're concerned, you know, if that's something that you don't want to do, if you don't like that, um, you don't have to. But pretty much you can eat fruit all time of the day. We just sort of recommend shifting your carbohydrate energy to the beginning part of the day so that you have time to burn through that. And then at night, Fill your plate with you know, lower carbohydrate foods that are whole foods that are full of vitamins and minerals to help you get great rest. You, know, you don't need a lot of energy at night because you're sleeping. You know, you're, you're resting, but you're having a lot of processes in your body while you're sleeping that require vitamins, water, minerals. And so eating a um, sort of a lighter meal in the evening is actually a really great way to achieve your best fasting blood glucose and also um, you know, use those nutrients at the right times. Right. Okay. Um, another question is, if insulin resistant, should you also limit the healthy plant-based fats only until rest? Or is it a health lifestyle to limit healthy fats in general? Mm -hmm. Great question. That is an excellent question because, you know, some people think, oh, if I just reset myself, I think you meant... Uh, reset. Yeah. yeah. Reset. Like, okay, I'm going to reverse insulin resistance. I'm going to lower my fat. And, you know, at that point, some people can start to add in smaller amounts of, um, you know, higher fat plant foods like avocado, nuts, seeds, those types of things. Um, it does only take a very small amount of those foods to um, increase insulin resistance again. So it's something to think about. Um, we generally recommend for overall for your whole lifespan, a 10 to 15% diet of fat from fat, from plant-based fats is actually the best and most ideal way to maintain your health for the long term. And you know, as a nurse, as somebody who promotes health and wellness in people, it's the diet I choose to eat. And so I have very small amounts of plant-based fats. Um, I tend to stay in the 10 to 15% range because I know that that's the, um, what's going to help me stay the least inflamed, it's gonna help my immune system for as long as possible, and it's gonna help me prevent these long-term chronic conditions. Like I don't want to have diabetes or heart disease. And you know, um, so that's why I choose that. And um, that's what we also recommend.
Right. Okay. So we have another question uh, from Karen Ranzi. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, why are there some plant-based educators recommending a keto type whole food plant-based diet? Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, and this is a fabulous question. And we um, actually covered very well in the Mastering Diabetes book. So it's something, it's a topic that we talk about a lot. Because, uh, the ketogenic diet is, um, you know, getting a lot of attention for the short-term results that they get. And we definitely can see the results that they, that people who are following a ketogenic diet get in the very short term. You know, they will see A1C things. And so when you're following a ketogenic version of a plant-based diet, you can also get those same results. But again, when you're looking at the long term, the biggest, um, I'd say like our biggest sort of takeaway from our program is that we are looking at short-term and long-term health. And even a diet that's high in plant-based fats is still going to put you at a higher degree of risk for developing insulin resistance and for weight gain because they're, they're much higher in calories. They're much higher in, so again, when we're looking at weight gain and insulin resistance and you want to keep the two of them minimal, um, re reducing your dietary fat from any source and using that 10 to 15% range is your best strategy. Okay, that, that's great. That's a great answer. Um, we have two last questions. One, um, you know, from someone in India, and, and they want to know, any comment on produce of the season to combat the attack of the season? Mm -hmm. Really great question. Absolutely. Um, we do recommend eating seasonally. I mean, there's such a great variety of local, you know, if you can get variety of local foods at, as they're being offered seasonally, um, the nutrients are kind of um, there to benefit you at that time of the season. You know, when we look at things like root vegetables that are abundant in the winter, you know, they're full of nutrients that you um, are, that are helping you to, des are designed to help you with, um, you know, improving your sleep and doing things that are going to support you in that time of the year. Um, you know, when you move into other citrus fruit grows in the winter, you know, a lot of times and in warmer climates, that's a wonderful fruit to add in um, to help, you know, with the experience of the, of the sunshine. <laughs> um, so, you know, we definitely recommend eating seasonally, um, especially because for a lot of people, if you can get locally grown foods, you're supporting your local economy, you're supporting your local markets. And also um, a lot of times, you can um, shop directly with the farmers in your area. And sometimes that can even make your shopping a little more affordable. Um, it can make the, um, you know, can generate again, like that um, community support, community involvement. Um, so we definitely uh, recommend that when you can. You know, especially in coronavirus times where supply chains around the world seem to be collapsing, especially with perishable goods, right? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, produce seems to be one of them. So mm -hmm. um, help out farmers that are in your vicinity and they might be sitting on excess supply of fruits and vegetables and are not able to offload it to, you know, bigger markets. And uh, maybe they're just a phone call away and they'll be happy to, uh, you know, give their produce to you, uh, uh, you know, at a lower cost. Um, one last question, which I think I missed in the list is, by Stephanie Kruger from Mayo Clinic, and she wants to know what oil can we stir fry with? And the answer is no. Uh, but the second one is, does this impact those with high cholesterol? Mm, absolutely. Um, you, uh, I'm assuming the no oil cooking. Yeah. Um, yes. Anytime you reduce oil from your diet, your cholesterol level will be much happier. Yeah. Going down. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. We're at uh, nine minutes past or 10 minutes past two, uh, you know, as uh, the, the time extension that we requested from our um, uh, audience and, and they've been most generous to stay on. And, you know, Kylie, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to hand over to Deborah because I'm sure that she has a lot to say and she's been listening uh, very quietly and silently. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to wrap this up quickly, but Kylie, we want to tell you thank you so much for the time that you've spent with us. It's been a power-packed hour. Uh, just the discussion, sort of the overview of obesity, insulin resistance, immune response, and then what we can do nutritionally to really um, take care of ourselves, especially in COVID times. I, we really appreciate the vision that you created for just how much fun it can be 
to eat healthy, to try different things and to create meals that are not only nutritious, but delicious and really sustain us. So I think we'll take away from this a lot to think about ourselves. And I don't know about the other participants, but I needed a kickstart to sort of reset my eating in the last couple of days because maybe been doing a little bit of stress eating during this time, mm -hmm. but I'm ready to feel better. And when we eat better, we feel better, right? So thank you so much. Because yeah. we're pretty much out of time, I just want to encourage you to take a moment in the chat box, leave your email if you haven't, so we can forward the resources and such to you. If you would like to know more about Kylie Buckner's work, please check it out at masteringdiabetes.org. Also, we would love to hear what your takeaways were from our time together. So if you want to include in the chat box what you're going to take with you from our hour together, we'd love to hear. Also, we want to thank Mayo Clinic for allowing us to open up our monthly video podcast to a wider audience. And again, we appreciate uh, Kylie Buckner being here. And to all of you, thanks for giving us this hour. We hope you have some great takeaways. We suspect you do. Have the best possible weekend, and we look forward to connecting with you again. Thank you so much, Kylie, and everyone else for being here. And absolutely, just want to also thank people who joined in from India. Oh my God, uh, it's past midnight. And so thank you. That's some uh, commitment and uh, we hope you really, really enjoyed. So we're signing off. Deborah Woods and I from the Coachpreneur Project. Thank you so much.